Uh, so, so the issue for the entire panel was the shortage of organs, particularly kidneys in the U.S. As Mike said in introducing the panel at the earlier session this morning, we are victims of our own success. Organ transplantation has become so effective, so relatively safe, um, so beneficial, that more and more people appropriately want to be recipients and want to have their lives saved. And we have a fairly flat line of, of donors. This is both deceased and living donors. Uh, our proposal is to substantially increase the use of living donors in transplantation. In, in fact, to make living donors the preferential choice in donation. But one reason for that is that there is a potential limit, most people agree, on the number of deceased donors in any society. Uh, in the US, it's been estimated to be about 14 or 15,000 deceased donors. Uh, of, that, of that potential uh, pool, we only actually retrieve organs at the moment from about half of that group. But, but even if we retrieve from 100%, 15,000. In terms of living donation in the states, uh, the number has been roughly between five and 7,000 uh, for the last 10 or 12 years. It's, it's not going up. In fact, it's going down a bit from a peak of 6,600 to about 5,600 last year. Um, why, so what can we do to, to meet this problem? The number, the potential number of living donors uh, is essentially unlimited. Uh, it, it, it's, it, the potential number are any adult who's healthy enough to donate a kidney. And, and at any one time in the United States, then that potential number would be in excess of 50 or 100 million people. I mean, it's, it's now, of course, I told you, we're only getting organs from five or 6,000 people a year, living organ donations. So the question is, why is that, and can we increase the number of living organ donors? One problem is, there has been disagreement in the ethics community, not just among ethicists, but indeed among countries. Um, Europe is a wonderful example of this, of whether living organ donation is entirely ethical. And the question has been, I mean, the, the ethical challenges have been using an organ from one person, not to benefit them, but to benefit a third party. And second, putting the donor at risk. On the other hand, the world has been using living donation since the first successful kidney transplant in 1954. The, the operation, the living donor operation, has been done more than a quarter of a million times in 40 countries around the world, none of those countries has prohibited or made illegal the use of living donors. That's that indeed, that, that large number and the fact that every country accepts it is, is reasonable evidence that the world and the ethics community regard it as ethical. There has been ambivalence in the transplantation community. So another question is, do we have enough confidence in the ethics of living donors to promote them. I mean, obviously they've been well promoted in Asian countries like Japan and South Korea, which rely primarily on living organ donors and much less on a deceased donor organ um, chain or supply. And um, in, in my view, uh, that would be entirely acceptable, uh, that, that is to promote the use of living donors. And, and then we come to the practical questions, how do you get from the flat line of living donors uh, to, to retrieve or to obtain living donations <laughs> from a much larger number? And the answer is you acknowledge, first of all, you, you get around the ambivalence regarding living donation and say it is ethical. Second, um, you uh, use uh, mathematical strategies, the kind that you've heard about, including Al Roth's description of long donor chains, uh, as large as 60, with 30 donors and 30 recipients. Uh, you, you ensure the public that their informed consent will be very essential in, in voluntary donation and that their safety will be protected. Uh, short term, uh, the, the risk to donors is about <coughs> three deaths in 10,000, which is comparable 
uh, to the risks in the, in the population and um, uh, the, the risk of end-stage renal disease is a fairly small risk um, that may be slightly higher than a, than a, than a health match uh, control group. Um, and finally, you promote it. You promote it through advertising and you promote it uh, through encouragement um, using civil and uh, other organizations. And the, the last question that we toyed with this morning is stopping the disincentives to living donation by making sure people don't lose their jobs and have health insurance uh, during the period of donation and indeed might might get some other benefits like life insurance um, and, um, and disability insurance. And then the, the, the final question is whether we should actually move towards a system of financial encouragement and compensation, something that has not been done in the United States, that's regarded as generally uh, not done throughout the rest of the world, uh, only it has been done uh, illegally on the black market, but whether that should be considered as one way to encourage living donors to come into the system. Thank you very much.